black 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 What is up, everybody? My name is James D. Fiore, and this is Blackballed. When the Me Too movement started, um, I was one of those guys who was um, who was really happy about the movement uh, about bad men getting their just desserts and and uh, brave women coming forward and and sharing their stories. Um, I was also very careful sometimes, and I, I used to get in trouble for this because uh, I I wanted to. I, I I wanted the stories that that were unearthed to be true, so that you know, so that men would be held accountable, and I also wanted the journalistic side of it to be ethical. And my guest today and I have been speaking. It's got to be for at least a, maybe a couple months almost now. Um, and what we did is we kind of together. Although I would never take any credit for the heavy lifting that this person has has, has gone through. But together we decided that um, she decided that she she wanted to come forward and talk about her experiences. And before we did that, um, she did all of these amazing, brave things um, in order for myself as a as a journalist to feel cool breaking a story like this. I wanted her to be as comfortable as possible. And I also wanted the other side to be um, reconciled, which is the the journalistic side. And we waited until those steps were complete, and now um, and now she's here. So I know that a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about and who I'm talking about um, based on the stories that have come out on the Klondike papers. So this story does circumnavigate around the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, and here to talk to us today is one of the bravest women I think I know right now, and her name is Cheryl Hope. Cheryl, how you doing? Hi. I'm okay. Um, <clears throat> the Klondike Papers, you're not in it. It has nothing, your story has nothing to do with it really. But the reason why this all came about between you and I was because, uh, because of the Klondike Papers and then um, my associations with, uh, with specifically with Richard Marsh, who is an ex-member of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. Um, I think maybe it would be best if we just sort of started from the very beginning. And if you could tell me, uh, my understanding is that when you're a part of the Christ, or of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, it means that you were born into it. That there, there are no nobody gets tapped to come into the church. It's it's families no. and generation after generation you're born into it. Can we start by you telling us um, what it's like to be in that community, and what it was like to grow up in that community? Well, um, for myself and for my particular family, we were we were the bottom of the totem pole. Um, we never crawled out of it. Um, we were subjected to whatever they felt was necessary. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons I stayed in as long as I did is I was I felt the need to protect my dad. I felt the need to try and help him with how he was being treated. 
Um, growing up was, it was horrible. I, that's all I can say. It was just horrible, horrible. I probably would have left a lot sooner than I did. Um, but I stayed until I couldn't stay any longer. I compare it to Scientology, but um, that that's that comparison is is I think is basically how I characterize that church based on how the church treats its members when they excommunicate or when they leave. But really, it's it seems more like uh, not Amish, but you know the 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 ladies are wearing bonnets and blouses and like long skirts and stuff like that, and it's a very patriarchal kind of society yeah um what is, what is the role of women in in the um, plymouth brethren to cook clean and produce babies that's it eh? and play the piano play an instrument but no so um if if we kind of go into what made me leave the very last final straw was we had been subjected to priestly visits after priestly visits after priestly visits. Um, any what, chance that they could give me... Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to ask, what's a priestly visit, just so we all can follow okay. along? So a priestly visit is when when um, certain brothers that are kind of leading the, the, the locality that we're living in um, come and visit you. So we just kind of termed them priestly visits. And... Mine started very early on, um, probably 13, um, and then heavily just got increased more and more and more and more. But my dad was um, very, very targeted. He was very targeted. Um, the final priestly visit that we had that, that made me realize that I needed to get out was we had been told that we were having a priestly visit before church, before meeting. And um, they had come and gathered us and we were sitting in the living room and my, we were being challenged on a lot of things. My mom actually stood up and tried to challenge them. And in that process of her standing up, got us shut up. So shut up is kind of, shut up is kind of like the first level of being excommunicated. And they had, were very, very thorough with my dad on the importance of being the man of the house and the head of the household. And because my mom had stood up, um, that was premise for being, us being shut up. In it, That devastated our family. I mean, we were all crying. It was one of those things that was just horrific to us. Um, they ended up taking that back because if we were um, remorseful enough, they allowed us to go to meeting that night, but they had planned this before meeting which normally they came after the meeting, but this one was before the meeting and we had to walk into meeting our family with four priests. And of course, everybody would have known what had happened. And that next morning, um, the the leader of the locality, who was an, an elderly gentleman who was supposed to be taken, was supposed to be the leader of the locality, came to our house the next morning in tears and apologized for what had happened to us and had said that his hands were tied. There was nothing more he could do for us. And it was in that moment, it was in that moment, I, I decided to, I decided to go. Um, but for me, it wasn't running away from home. For me, it was, for me, it was, I was leaving the planet. I was done. I had gone mm. through at that point, six, 16 years and yeah, 12, 13 of those years were, were, were hell. I just want to, I, 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 I want to point something out, um, for, for our audience. Um, you today, um, you, when I called you, uh, after you had gone to this appointment that you went to today, you had told me that it was, um, basically the hardest thing that you have done since you left the church. And that yeah. was, um, you went to the police to file a police report. Um, Listen, you've been through a lot, not just in your life, but today even. You told me that the police were very thorough, very, very Today detailed. was the hardest day I've ever lived. Yeah. Yeah. Four so hours. Today you, you was can, the hardest day. Yeah. You can spare us whatever details you want to spare us, but can you um, can you, can you, you tell us basically like a, a, a sort of skeletal idea of, of what it is that you went through with the church? Like why basically the reason why we're having this conversation and you can be as non-specific as you want to be because you've been through enough today already. So 
basically, so if you first, want, I can lead first, you along. It's it's up to you. No, I'm good. Okay. Um, I just say first of all, my whole reason for doing this is um. Like I don't, I don't have a vendetta against at the church. I don't. I mean, I've done years and years and years of therapy. My issue is, is that there, this, this, this certain man has had complaints against him over and over and over from that I've heard from other people. It's been taken some to police, some back, and they were supposed to deal with it. And so I guess my biggest thing is, is I just, I'm coming forward because I have nieces and nephews in there. And I met a lady through this who had this happen with the same perpetrator four years ago. And she's not even a part of the brethren, but she worked in close proximity to where he was. And she told me stories of other brethren females that were working there and what was happening. And I'm like, my nieces are in there and they're close to the ages that could be going and working at this place of business. And that that destroyed me. I I've been looking for a way to kind of come out and find a way to tell my story. It's not your typical sexual sexual abuse story. It's um, more in depth than that. Um, and so trying to find, I kind of just was trying to find ways that I could kind of weave in and be able to know that I was supported and know that um, I had a kind of a door open to be able to come in and tell my story, to bring the results that I want to bring. Um, this is not just for me. This isn't for me. This is for my nieces and nephews that are still in there. This is for all the people who have shared their stories for me through this that are too scared to come forward. Um, I don't really have a choice in coming forward. I had to come forward. I didn't have a choice. I had to come forward. Um, this has to stop. This has to stop somewhere. And so for me, it was about trying to find another set of big girl panties to put on that I used to leave the cult with to do this. Um, I have to say that this is much harder than the day I left home. So the reason why that I am here um, and to explain my story is um, I was very young. I was very young when I was um, placed in, in, I'm going to say his name, Alan Drever's home. <sighs> I was very young. Um, and so my dad was in a really bad car accident when I was just over two and a half. Um, prior to that, my brother had been born when I was two, he had gone through some health issues. My dad had a, it was a serious accident. They didn't think he was going to make it. Um, and it's not uncommon for families to just be placed in other homes. They just get picked up and get placed in other homes. Um, the first night I was there, the very first night he helped himself, um, I'll never forget him unzipping my sleeper. I remember the sleeper I was, I had, and it just snowballed from there. It was, there's just one thing after another, after another, uh, to give you kind of context. I mean, I don't know how much I'm going to be able to get into this today just because I had to do it for four hours earlier today. Um, he had a toolbox and he had a toolbox that he used to fix children. He had used a, a little girls. He, it was his job to fix little girls and he made me believe that through and through that i need to be fixed in any kind of way if i had if i cried i had to be fixed if i had a stomach ache i had to be fixed if i showed any kind of uh, anything that a little child would would show i had to be fixed and the toolbox came out um He didn't just stop there. Um, he he took me to other places. He took me to other people. Um, oh, it's so hard to talk about. Yeah. Um, the, it, um, yeah. It's, yeah. He just... Go ahead. It's just... He, he's a very sick man. He was a, he's a very, he's a very sick man. He's just, he's not, it's not your normal. I mean, I guess I don't know what a normal sexual abuse case is, but he was, he was a very sick man. And he made, he made me believe that everything I did, I was doing to help my father. And he, he grilled that into me, grilled that into me that I needed to help my dad. And that anything that I was doing like this, I was helping my dad. 
And so as a little girl, I believed that. Like, I believed that. Um, I, for, it, I'll give you an example. Yeah, of go, when, ahead. go ahead. No, I was just going to say, just, go ahead. I kinda, yeah, I was just like, one of the... One of the things he did in his toolbox was um, he had he had candy in there, and um, if things hurt me, I had to eat a smarty. Um, that was one of the biggest things that he had started with. He would dip his tongue in his alcohol drinks and make me suck it off. He he syringed me things that made me sleepy. He would ask me if I was sleepy yet, and like he just he he held no i can talk from a 47 year old now he held no concept of um an emotional attachment to to somebody right he i i felt just owned by him to me i was just i was his um he came home one day he was frustrated and he threw his wife's bra on me and told me one day I would feel it. I would feel it out and that I, he had to get me ready for a husband. And literally sat there and he raped me and then turned around and just left me. I remember going to the bathroom after that. I had to clean myself up. I had to, there was nobody, there was nobody there to help me. And like, how old I were you? Been, I would have been probably three years old and trying to process this. Um, he took me to this, um, what I, I know now it was a mobile home. Um, and these men came there and um, they offered me a candy um, that looked kind of like a piece of sugar. And I took it it made my mouth immediately dry. And I just remember that I couldn't swallow properly. And then I started, like I couldn't swallow my own saliva. And these men that came um, looked very much like Hutterites. Um, I'm not going to claim they're Hutterites, but they looked 90% Hutterites. And they spoke a different language. And they put me face down on a table on a soft blanket. And all I remember that whole time is, how much it hurt while I had to stare at a green and clear ashtray and I couldn't swallow. I just felt the drool drooling down me. Um, it was hard. It's hard. A lot of this stuff is so, it's hard to put into context, into words, how confused I was with having men enjoy you at the same time that you're incapacitated and that as a little girl, I had like no fucking clue how to help myself. Like I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, the second time that I was taken to that mobile home, um, it was just three of them. And I was placed, I could literally draw the inside of this house. Most, most of the houses that I was in, I know exactly all the little quirks and twerks inside them. This time that he brought these just three men over, I was in one of the bedrooms and um, the first guy sat there and literally stimulated me for what seemed like hours, literally hours. That's all he did. Um, someone knocked on the door and told him to hurry up. Um, the thing that I remembered about this one specific gentleman that has always stood in my mind is his smell. So he had just this most awful smell to him. And for me, I didn't, I couldn't place the smell. And I was trying to place the smell. Was this horse manure? Was this like horse poo? Was it pig poo? Was it cow poo? I was trying to think like, what is this smell? And later on, I was, I was taken out to the couch out there and I was propped up against Ellen while I was kind of like coming to, and I saw him smoking, which, which is, I had never seen him smoke before. And I realized what he was smoking was the same smell that this guy smelt like. And I mean, yeah. I know now at my age, that smell was pot, right? But right. back then I had never been introduced to anything like that. And it, but it was, it was literally that smell that just burns into my memory of what that room entailed. 
the level of manipulation i mean this is yeah. all under the b, b side or in front of the backdrop of a of a religious group um often probably used as a shield right the religious aspect of it all um alan drever um last name d-r-e-v-e-r is the man and he he was an elder in the plymouth brethren christian church is that is that right sorry say that again sorry is he an elder in the in the church so um so he's not a leading brother but his wife his his wife is the brother of the main perpetrator that brainwashed me and that would take me in all my priestly visits and the one that like hunted me down all the time um even after i left he did they camped outside my fourplex they followed me and my husband around everywhere we went um my husband got so frustrated one time in the mall that he turned around and went right up. But I'm going to say his name, Morse Hope. He went right up behind Morse Hope and told him, like literally said, the devil's watching you. Um, because that's what they, that's, that's how they view people that you're married to. Right. But so even though he wasn't an elder, he had someone, um, he was married to the sister of, of Morse and I can, I, Morse knew what was going on. Edna had him come over one time after Ellen wouldn't quit me, leaving me alone. And there were some things that happened and she got scared and she called Morse to come over and there was a huge fight. There was a huge thing. And Ellen literally would not come out of the room where he had me until there was a big crash. And then he went out and like, Morse knew what was going on. And honestly, if I can put two and two together and if I can say why I think I was so targeted to to be um, to be kicked, to, he, that I was drove out of that church. I, as soon as I started hitting an age where I was developing, where I was starting to get a little bit of a voice, where I was starting to kind of understand um, what was going on and I really started rebelling, Morse got on board. Morse got on board and he was any chance he had in any family that he could gear up against either my mom, my dad, or me or my siblings, it was to get me out. And he got me out. So normally when someone leaves, um, parents come after their children. Priests come after those children. I had not one fucking person come after me. I left with a girl. Yep, go ahead. I left with a girl and um, it was like the, the leading priest's granddaughter and um i sat in the in the basement of an apartment while her parents were outside pleading for her to come back and i sat there thinking where are my parents where like not that i wanted to go back i didn't want to go back but it was just the just the the sheer um the sheer difference in what it was and i never i was never i was never am i cutting the note Nope, you're good. No, um, it was, it was, it was just such a real hard pill to swallow that nobody came after me. Never, nobody came after me. All oh, these ear. And we spoke on the we spoke um, earlier today, and um, we kind of we talked about that aspect a little bit, and it, and it, it must have been so confusing because, in a way, they did you a favor, and it's almost the most psychologically I know, and I, I get it it's bittersweet it is it is bittersweet yeah. i didn't want to go back but it was hard it was super super hard that my parents oh gosh it's so hard they just didn't care enough i mean i'm spent out 30 years and it is probably the deepest wound i have that i that i still deal with i yeah. still deal with it i don't i probably will always deal with it um just because my whole family's in there. I'm the only sibling out. Um, I'm sorry. No, please. Um, you don't have anything to apologize for. Please. Um, it was hard. It's just hard. It's hard. It's hard when this all gets brought up. And it's one of the reasons why I've waited 30 years to bloody do this. I think I've needed 30 years of therapy to be able to do it. Um, um, it just there's a lot of things that just really stick with you that I don't know if you ever get over. And, um, a lot of people ask why I never kept in contact with everybody from that had left. And I didn't, I kind of secluded myself. 
I'm not really big in everything. I kind of secluded myself. I knew, I knew, I knew I couldn't do it. I knew I couldn't, I needed to just kind of um, get into my cave and try and make a life inside my cave um, as best as I could. Um, I was an alcoholic. Um, I've tried committing suicide many times. Um, my husband is my angel. My, I uh, got a soul sister who has rocked my back. Um, but it's, it's hard and it's hard to try and bring to the public what Morse knew. And I mean, maybe he might've not have known everything, but he knew Morse knew that what Ellen was doing to me. Can you, can you tell us who and, Morse and, and, is? Like So Morse is, um, um Morse, oh, he's, he's passed away. He's not, he's not around anymore. Um, so he, 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 him, uh, Dudley Boyer and Harry Drever, there was these three men who kind of overturned the, the main, um, uh, leading a gentleman that was in there and his name was Walter Drever. So he was an, he was an older, older gentleman, um, very compassionate, very kind. He tried to do what he could do, but these three men came in and they started doing all the priestly visits. They started um, speaking up more in church. They, they they ended up overthrowing him and they got in. And they were the people that wreaked havoc on Maple Creek. If I could say the poison in Maple Creek was that combination of those three. And, um, you know, not a lot of people knew what was going on in our house. Um, uh, there was families that certainly did. Um but the amount of priestly visits we were getting, I don't think people knew. Like, it was nothing for us to have two or three priestly visits in a week. And I knew. I knew if I was caught. I had a paper out. I knew if I was caught talking to someone outside the church on my paper out. I knew I, I was counting on a on a priestly visit that night. And I would. I'd get it. And then they would just sit there for, like, hours on end, sitting there and telling you how awful you are. And, like, how you're destroying your parents. And you're, you're making your parents sick. And how um, full of the devil I am. And they just they just strip you, strip you, strip you, strip you down until there's nothing left of you. So when I first wanted, when I first realized that I couldn't do that church anymore, it wasn't to leave. I was leaving home. I was leaving this planet. There, that option of me running away from home wasn't even there. The only reason it came onto the table was because my mom found my suicide poem. And... Um, I, I had to rewrote my plan. And so I kind of um, befriended uh, the girl that I left with. We got became close. She was struggling. I knew she was struggling. I had seen her struggle. And so we became friends and we left together. Um, the, the priestly visit thing, is, it, it sounds like such a such a manipulative tool, like a, like a, like some yeah, sort of yeah, spiritual yeah. and moral intervention. And you were getting them yeah. like two or three times a week by people who were shielding your abuser, basically. Yes, 100%. And I, like, if I look back on it now, like when I, so like, you have to just kind of piece things together through therapy. And when you're trying to, when you're trying to, I don't, it's, it's, it's hard to bring this basket out and deal with it. So you take it off in bits and pieces when you can. And each time that each time that you bite bits and pieces off, things start making more sense. So, I mean, when you understand the whole complexity of my story and how it, how it is and the places he took me, there was drugs involved. There was, and I can say it was drugs because at 47, now I know that that's what it was that I, that it was. And um, there was just a lot of layers involved. And I questioned my dad's accident at two and a half. Was it an accident? That's what I, yeah. that's what, that's my question to my parents. If, if they ever see this is, was it an accident? Really? Like, yeah. after, listen, I, I just, this is my plea to them right now. It's like, watch this, listen to my bloody story and then ask yourself if my dad's accident was a freaking accident. What was the accident? It's just, so he fell off a scaffolding building and he almost died. And it was that moment that I got placed in the hands of Ellen. So if I'm going to give just kind of a ton context to this on what my abuse was kind of like. Okay. So not only was, 
yes, he groomed me. He groomed, like, I know at my age and going back and write, you write everything down, you know, I know he groomed me, right? He even used a plastic inch snake on me and like, he just, he groomed me. He groomed me. Anyhow, there was places that I was taken to. Um, ah, yeah. It's okay. He, he took me to, I mentioned the mobile home with what I am assuming were Hutterites. He then took me to this house. I shouldn't say he didn't take me to this house. He took me to some truckers. I'll get to the house later. He took me to some truckers and he started my grooming with a pencil. So it was this pencil that he kept in his shirt pocket. And that was part of um, also when he brought out his toolbox, the pencil was there. And so if I can take this into just a little bit fast forward motion, is he started wrapping things around this pencil and he inserted them into me and they had a string on them with a little thing on the bottom and he inserted them into my vagina and then i was taken to trucker i was taken to two specific truckers that i remember um one trucker's name was jerry and he the 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 night before i was taken to this place he took a chair and pushed it on my toe and like pushed down on it. He heard it. His wife wrapped my toe up. And um, that next morning I was being rushed out. He, I had to wear the shoes, but my shoe felt super, super, super tight. And I remember crying to my oldest sister, like, like being like, my, my, this really hurts. There's no way I can walk on this. This hurts. And he took me to a trucker that day that took off my shoe and took stuff out of my shoe. Plus took out the stuff out of my own vagina and then read a story to me. And that was, and, that and was, the, I had to wait for Ellen to come back. The implication is that, that you were being muled, right? That, that you were being sent, like drugs were being mm -hmm. placed onto you and inside of you mm -hmm. to. And I make, I'm, I'm, you guys can draw your own conclusions on what was stuffed in me. Um, but it was. I mean, what else would have it been, right? So if anybody else has any other ideas of what it was been, then they can change my perception on the did whole you, story. Did you cross um, the I, border? Sorry, no, 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 no. I never, the only house, the house that I went to that was the farthest away, I don't know how far it was. I just remember it was this really long, bumpy road. Um, but that was with a driver that I ended up taking over me. So... The other trucker I was taken to was a much bigger truck. He had, um, I guess you maybe call it a sleeper in the back. I just remember the red, it was just kind of red fuzzy stuff around it. That day I was filled so full. He had taped over top of my vagina. I didn't even have underwear on. And he carried me from his, his truck to this, this trucker's truck. And um, I remember this trucker being very gentle with trying to take the tape off, asking me if it hurt. Um, uh, he took everything out, um, took the stuff out of my, my, my footwear. And I, the whole time doing this, I could see some pop and chips. And so that's literally all my, I was folk fixated on was like how I could see this pop and chips. And I really wanted this pop and chips. And so he told me that I could have this pop and chips if he let me do whatever I wanted to him. He I, like he wanted to me. And I did. That's how bad I wanted my pop and chips. But by that time, and, I mean, um, yeah, you, you've been groomed. Oh, I would, like yeah, said, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and so it switched to, it switched to a lady driving me around and it was a, a vehicle that had, was like this burnt orange vehicle with a cream top. And, um, she was really my, the lady who taught me the rules. She was very, very firm with the rules of no crying. Um, you don't question, um, the no crying was like very, 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 very huge. It was over and over and over. And again, she really put in there the importance of doing this for my dad and the amount of people that I was helping out by doing this. Um, her, she, the thing that I remember with her is 
she she must have put a bottle of perfume on every time before she got into that vehicle it hurt my throat it hurt my nose it was to this day i cannot wear perfume like anything fragrance i cannot it's perfume just does me in but her perfume was horrible and she she took me to different places um one I one of the places she took me to was another mobile home, and this was in Maple Creek. It was a bluey green mobile home. Um, I had to wear a backpack, and I was um, she on the way. She had kind of prepped me with about being brave, that um, I had to go into this place by myself, um, and that I needed to be brave. You can be brave, right? It was the brave was her biggest word that she used on this this one occasion. And normally she didn't stand, get out and stand by the car and watch me walk in. Um, normally people came out and met and met me and took me. Um, this one, I had to walk in by myself. And this mobile home, I remember walking by and it had really tall grass. I remember it like rubbing against my leg. There was a pedal bike that was kind of leaned over to the side. I walked up these stairs and kind of went to the right a little bit and then to the doorway. And I was met by two, two men two very kind of heavy set men. Um, and they were, it was just, it was a different one in there. It was very different there. They kind of gave me, they took the backpack. Um, they made me sit on the couch and I had to sit a certain way. Um, my underwear had to come off and they had, they had pasted something on my, my vagina at that point in time. Um, they had a dog and the dog was tall enough to rest rest his head on and um he was very interested in me but while I was sitting on this they were in the kitchen that was off to the left of me and they were taking the stuff out of the backpack and the one thing I remember coming out of this backpack was a stack of cash and I was like for me I'd never I had never seen cash like that before ever have I I'd never had seen cash like that I mean we we were a very poor family um the brethren didn't help us out like they helped other families out we were on our own um, and then they proceeded to use this cash. <sighs> this is so hard. I know you guys need to hear it. <sighs> Just take a second. Take they would roll this, they rolled this cash up and they inserted it into me and started taking pictures. Oh my God. And then they would show me the picture that they took. So I'm guessing it was a Polaroid. I mean, I... This is how many years ago. I don't think there was any other cameras that, but they would show me what they were doing with these pictures that they were taking. Um, I was there for a lengthy time of many, many different kinds of pictures. Um, um, they never, they never um, raped me. They, they, for them, this was all pictures. This was pictures. This was um, pictures of them naked with me. Um, pictures of their dog doing stuff. Um, they were all about the pictures. They were all about the pictures. All about the pictures. Um, yeah, that was that was the that's yeah. It's um, it's 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 heinous obviously it's it's interesting to me that when you just say um that they didn't rape you because i listen to that and i just think that it is rape and 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 i understand what you meant i, I understand you know exactly what you mean but listening to that and i'm sure people listening to this are first of all actually let's prioritize it I know that everybody watching this is like, holy shit, this woman is brave. <laughs> so I need you to know that. I, I need you to under, and I've told you, you know, this before. And I don't, like I, I know, and I don't feel brave. I feel like I have to do this. I like, I probably wouldn't have done this. Like I literally half hour before this, I wanted to back out. Yeah. And I, I just think, think of my nieces and I think of all, I, all the people that, Maybe it wasn't as graphic as what has happened to me. Maybe it was. I just mm -hmm. want those people to understand that this has to fucking stop. And I'm saying that so from the core of my freaking being that this has to fucking stop. 
like four years ago was a lady who came forward to me. This has to stop. It just has to stop. And the only way it stops is by everybody coming together. I don't care what way, but everybody needs to come together. And this man needs help. These men, the people, they need help. It, and I don't, it's not like, I don't get into this about like, oh, I'm here to like shut down the Plymouth Brethren Christian. It's not that. I just want, I just want people safe. I just yeah. want, I want my nieces and nephews safe. I want my parents safe. I want, I want the other survivors to feel safe enough to say, holy shit, if she can come out and say what she's saying, then maybe, maybe I can. And, and I know those people know who I'm talking about. There's, there's, there's people who have come forward that I know need to come forward. And. Well, since we, when we first started talking, when we first started talking weeks ago, um, nobody had really come forward. No one had filled out a police report. You hadn't found anybody else at that point in time who had been victimized by this person. We started talking. I well, I did when I was really younger. I did. Okay. So when I had when I had left, I, I there was somebody who came forward to me. Um, it was a, a man who came forward to me. Um, I'm very close with. Um, mm-hmm. he came forward. Um, so I was living over my bubble home. So we were in Red Deer. So it was I was it was quite a few years ago, and we were just sitting on the having a talk, and he mentioned um Ellen Drever, and I just said me too. And we never really went much more for it. I think it was it was a lot of silence, and I think that silence spoke a lot for 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 the both of us. Yeah. Um, but other than him, no, no. But what you've accomplished, in my eyes, since I started talking to you, has been a, just fucking amazing. Like like be, when we started talking, I you you told me your story, and I was floored, of course, and and um completely horrified of of what you experienced but since then you have found two other people who are going to fill out police reports you filed your own police report um Mm -hmm. you know you were able to just show a kind of bravery that i think a lot of people are are hearing right now and i know you don't want to be called brave and i get that like there, there's a strange thing that happens to people that are in your position that i've seen many many times before i've had personal experience um with other people that i know that have done what you've done and and they don't want to focus on bravery at all there is a very hardcore sense of like humility when it comes to what you're doing because mm-hmm. you and i have spoken about this in the last few days about how one of the greatest things that could come out of all this is to what what you just said is to find others that could come forward and stop being victimized um i find it interesting and maybe even a little sad that you don't have anything against the church because as i'm listening to this all i want to do is destroy that church <laughs> like i know and, brick, but i've had you know? like a lot of therapy like i've had you have to understand how much therapy that i have had that I've had to go through to come to a place of it. Cause it ate me alive. It ate me alive. The rage. I mean, I'm still very, I get full of rage. Absolutely. At the hypocrisy, at the, the injustice. Absolutely. But I also understand that um, religion is not going to go anywhere. Right. Like it's not going to go anywhere. And so, I mean, my biggest, I mean, my biggest loftiest dream is to make this plea to the, the 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 people that are in this church to say, like, come on, just like, I don't give a shit what you do with this stuff. I'm going to heal myself. I'm going to find a way to heal myself. But get this man some help. Like, to me, it's just like, like, how can you, I didn't know they're not going, they're not going to believe my story. I, I'm, I'm like, thank God I have a soul sister who's like very much held my hand in that, in that process of like, we, I know they're not going to, they're not, this is going to be deny, 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 deny. I get that. But, but while they're watching this, cause they'll watch this. I challenge you. I freaking challenge you. I challenge you to be able to be a bloody Christian and get this man some help. That's like, interesting I, that I, you say I, help. I just, you you you, you, you want help. him to get you want help. him to that see that, that to me is amazing him? like that's the thing is how like I, i've been sitting with this for weeks i mean i don't sleep yeah. i'm like sitting there like 
this is a this is a worldwide problem. We can't just lock these bastards up as much as we want to because they get out and they just go back to it. These people need help. We need to have a system that literally takes these people and puts them through, through some freaking kind of rehab because they're sick. Ellen's sick. Like he he I can't even I hope you guys can feel to the core of you when I say he was a sick 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 man. Yeah. He, I, I'm going to tell you how sick he was. So not every time that he brought that, that, are you, can I, can I take that picture down? Sorry. It's just Which like picture? literally. Oh, is it stuck? I have a, the picture of me. Yeah. Oh, stuck on that, that, that happens sometimes, but. Is okay. It down oh, now? I just, I had to, I'm like, like sorry that, that my, you were the only one that saw okay, that. Sometimes she, a guest will see okay. a picture that will stay up, but it wasn't okay. really up for anyone. Else. Okay, <laughs> it was, sorry. it was staying up. And I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't look at my little girl anymore. I'm sorry. Um, Go ahead. So, no, no, no worries at all. Um, so, when he brought this tool, so there's there's different parts of him when he brought this toolbox out. Um, he was on a mission. So when he brought this toolbox out, and if he came in and, and he, I could just know, I just knew, I knew that, um, oh, this is a this is a day. This is this is work. We're working. We're working. Um, we're working. And then there was other times he'd come in and he, he wasn't even himself. He wasn't even him, it, but he was him. And he would sit at the foot of my, my, the bed, pull me down and he would talk to himself. He would, he would like laugh. He was, but not to me. It was like he was in his own little world and I was his play box. I was his sandbox. I was his, I was his toy. And so that happened like, about three times that just like really shocked me. It scared me because here's this man at the end and he's like, like just not being, I mean, not that I, not that I wanted, I wanted him to be the other one because that was, I mean, very painful. Right. But he was sick. He was super sick. And like, I have empathy towards not him, but I have empathy towards somebody who is as sick as that, that lives on a planet and we're in a justice system that doesn't look at what perpetrators and what these people really need, right? Yes, okay, so we put them behind bars, put them behind bars, but get that they, they need help. They need help so that when they come out of there, they are can be reintroduced into society that literally are knowing. But now we have... Now I'm stuck up against, I'm in this cult and I'm up against this cult and I'm calling it a cult because I believe it was yeah. a cult. I don't care what everybody else thinks. Oh, it's a cult. I believe it was a cult. I know yeah. it was a cult. So now I'm up against having to try and tell my story in a judicial system that doesn't even give what I want to happen and up against I, I, a cult that is going to be like this lady's crazy that never happened this is this is bullshit like this is this is it's just deny 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 right so when this stuff would bubble up i would have to i would have to look at it kind of hold it in my hand look out at the world and be like can i do it no i can't stuff it back down again right yeah um so honestly the first thing that happened was the the breaking brethren um um documentary that came out when that came out, I was in a heat of an episode, in a heat of all this resurfacing. And I contacted Christine, Chris, Christina Heggy, and I, I asked her, I said, has anybody come forward since the documentary regarding sexual abuse and kind of more of like more of a complex sexual abuse? Has anybody come forward? And uh, no, she hadn't. Nobody had come forward. So I kind of just sat back. I had re-entered therapy again and um, thought, like, I'm going to have to just deal with this again on my own, right? Until, you know, I, the stuff with, you know, the conduct papers came forward and I was like, holy crap. Um, I contacted Richard Marsh and I, he, yeah, I contacted him and um, I knew that this door was opening for me and I just had to find a way to put my heart in a cast to put my mind in a cast 
ungag myself and be like, whatever happens, happens. Got my cameras working around my house. Um, met with the police. Um, met with the police again today. I was there for four hours. I'm there again tomorrow. Um, it's just... I can't give my yeah. energy into do I would I would I want do I want the would I want the Plymouth Brethren Church to have the charity status removed? Absolutely. Absolutely 110%. Um mm -hmm. it they 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 sh they are not a charity. They should not have a charity status. Right? If they cannot have an open mind and allow someone to come forward with their story and be like okay, let's just hear this and maybe, maybe this happened. Like to even be open to that idea. I contacted my parents um, over 10 years ago about this and um, nothing was done about it. Nothing was done. I was on the phone call with both my mom and dad and it was either one brother or two brothers, but I know a brother was on there. And um, I it was just a little tidbit of it, right? I had to test the waters. Um, I remember getting off that phone call and I threw my house phone. I threw yeah. it clear across down the stairs. I was, I was done. I was so done because it's, I've been waiting for a moment to bring the worst hurt that I endured in there out to somebody or something. And back in March, I contacted a sibling, right? I contacted, I contacted her to be for help, right? I mean, what do we do? We, we reach out to those people that were a part of that time, right? And that was in that was in March. I I we had I got an email back so that she had to digest the letter I gave her and I've never heard back. So I'm not only digesting this um grief of loss of family again, his trying to stand up and be a voice after I heard this story of this girl that it just happened to four years ago. Be able to stand up and find this voice and try and find a way to communicate it to you guys um in a in a digestible manner um that people can understand the 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 intensity and the what what we're actually up against with this cult right yeah, is you can't we magnitude. can't just walk in and be like hey you need to yeah it's the, yes the magnitude absolutely right um i think um i was i think oh, can ahead. i tell you something can i i, I just because you know, the, the two things that stand out for me, and I don't want to repeat myself too much here, but, um, and we don't have to delve into it at all, but just as a bullet point thing that I'm both impressed with and maybe even a little bit like kind of confused by is um, your, your un the unwillingness that you have to want to say, I want to destroy the church and the unwillingness that you have to be like, I just want to kill this guy. You, like you, you, you want people like him to get help and you don't want to destroy this church. I find that remarkable. I think that's a testament to your strength. Um, you know, so it, it, it's confusing to me because as a, as a, as a dad and a brother, you know, um, you know, I, I, I'd be in jail. Um, and, and I know that that's not the right answer. That's the emotional, angry response. That's the primal reptilian well, that's response. Human response. Right. Yeah, it's the human response and my husband's right there. Yeah. Yeah. And um I we're we're going to we're going to we're going to stop the show in the next 5 minutes because what I think that you've done tonight has already been accomplished. Um and I don't need you to unless you want to continue because I, I I just think that first of all the details are you don't need to go into any more of those details um because I think that okay. you you've shared so much. Um you've had such a long day. Again, you were at the police station filing that report today for 4 hours that is taxing um you know mm -hmm. and um is there anything else that you want to say maybe even like a direct appeal to to people that are in the church so um well first of all i just want to i just kind of want to kind of just overview that um i want to just kind of i want to i do want to make a plea because there was a down syndrome boy that was involved in this um so there's two things that I, you know, I don't know if you had that picture of that car, but there's, there's a car that I'm looking for. There's a car that this lady driver drove me around in. Um, there's also a down syndrome boy that, um, um, I was met when I was taken to this concept, um, with, it was a whole other story that happened there. Um, 
my heart my heart broke for this with this down syndrome boy um and he was a part mm -hmm. of a house that i was that was taken down it was the down this really bumpy road for quite a while and um we were videoed and um so i need i need to understand too like yeah so it's a car that's, that looks similar to this it's a deeper it's a more of a deeper it's like a burnt orange and the passenger the the, the passenger door handle stuck if someone found me this car i could tell you how to open it um but yeah so this this that car was um the car that took me to the multiple places that i was taken to um <sighs> The Down syndrome boy had um, like it's very like strawberry gingery hair. It was very he was very fair haired. Um, he would have been four or five years older than me. Um, there's not a whole lot of it was a small it's a small town. It's a small town. So I just hope somebody can find this Down syndrome boy and then he's still a, I I yeah my heart my heart still breaks for him. Um, so he was brought into he was brought into some of the places with me. Um, my plea to, I guess, first and foremost is I really, really, really hope that, um, some of these survivors can come forward. I am not the only one. I am by far not the only one. Um, I know it's hard. I know it's super, super hard. Um, we need to start collecting these stories. Um, if you're not willing to talk about them, you can most definitely, I've got an email set up for them. Um, I've talked to the police about this. Um, I just, we need to start collecting the stories and the time is now, right? Uh, we had Me Too movement happen whenever. This is the Me Too movement of the PBCC and it has to happen now. It has mm -hmm. to start. I understand yeah. some of you have family still in there, that is why you should be doing this, right? You cannot be afraid of um, what it would do to them. My heart is broken for what this is going to do to my parents. I, it, it, it's, it's, I even sitting at the, the police station today before I'd gone in, I was in tears. Um, my heart is just broken for them, right? Because they're going to believe that I am evil. They're going to believe that um, this is a vendetta against the church. They're going to believe that um, this is Cheryl just being full of the devil again. And I think the biggest thing that I want to tell all the survivors that are out there, um, especially in Canada is where we're focusing on, um, is these stories have to come forward. And I, James will share, there's an email that's set up that we can share at the end. Mm -hmm. My plea to the, to the, to the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church. Um, I don't hate you. I don't because did I? Oh yes, I did. I did hate you. I did. Um, I don't hate you. If you want to have your church, have it, but you need to clean the mess up. You've got to take these stories and be open to listening that this shit actually happened because it actually happened. Yeah. I lived um, it to the core. What is that email? You set it up, right? It was a proton email, wasn't it? I did. It was, um, I'm going to share it in our chat system and we can, we can, we can speak it up or say it out loud. Obviously I don't have a graphic or anything for it cause I don't know it yet, but, um, Oh, I just started up. So it's um, Cheryl Hope, but it's capital C, capital H, at yep. proton.me. Dot me. Oh, Cheryl. Okay. Cheryl Hope at proton.me. Proton.me. And it's a capital C and a capital H. Like that? In chat. Oh, I can't do it in chat. Hold on. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. I am going to do this. Is that right? Yes, that's it. Yeah. That's okay. It. So yeah. you see um, Cheryl's uh, email, Cheryl Hope at Proton.me. I don't, I'm not sure if the uppercase or lowercase matters in that email, but either way, it's I don't uh, know, capital C, but capital I'm, I'm, yeah. 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 So um, if, if anybody out there, or even if they want to share a story and they're not part of the church, right? Like, it's yes, just, because yeah. this, yes, exactly. Um, This, this lady that came forward that was just four years ago, she wasn't even a part of it. Like, she wasn't a part of it, but she was working for them. 
And so, and it was still was, it was El, like, it still was Ellen and um, yeah. his son was involved. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, yeah, go ahead. I guess I just, I just, my, my heart's just going out to the other survivors and I just, I hope you feel me. I hope I'm, feel free to contact me. Um, I just, I really want to get the ball rolling on this. Um, I think our moment is now, I think we have a lot of eyes on, um, the, the, some of the things that are happening within the church. And the only reason why I say I want the charity status gone is because they don't deserve it. So clean up your church and you can deserve it again, but you don't deserve it right now. Yeah. You're you're so much nicer than I am. (laughs) And you know what? I, like, I wasn't always, I wasn't always like this. Trust me. I was not always like this. I wasn't, I wasn't always like Mm. this, but I've just kind of gotten to the point of, we have to find a way to fix this. So you got, kind of got to lose the noise and kind of mm-hmm. hone in on how do you fix this problem? Because it's not being fixed. It's not being fixed outside the church. It's not being fixed inside the church. We have a judicial system that um, is not supportive of a lot of the whole um, start to finish of doing this. Right. Um, so yeah. I'm just... I just I I'm that way because I I have I have exhausted my gas tanks on the other one. Well, I I think you're a remarkable woman. I I'm I'm a I think I'm a better person just for knowing you. Um, we'll talk. I'll probably call you tonight, <laughs> you know, okay. to let you know how how well you did. But um, thank you so much. I, I know that wasn't easy. Thank I know you you've had a me. very very tough day. Um, yeah, it was a rough day. <laughs> you know. I basically at this point consider you a friend because I just I feel like I I, I know yeah I know me so too much about absolutely you. yeah yeah <clears throat> I'm I've uh, you know this is a journey that is your journey I am privileged to be um, a small part of it and um, you know thank you again so that's Cheryl Hope thank again so her much. email is Cheryl Hope at Proton dot me uh, that's Cheryl Hope at Proton dot me thank you Cheryl I appreciate that okay thank you we'll so talk much soon. no problem thank okay. you. Um, wow. What do you say? (laughs) There is a, I don't believe in hell. So I don't, I can't even say there's a place in hell for, for many of the people that she was talking about. What a remarkable example of strength. She doesn't want the church to be gone. She wants the man that abused her to get help. And most people watching this podcast were like, burn that shit to the ground and string that man up. And and it's funny because I said that out loud just now and I felt that sort of tinge of like, don't be fucking like that. But, you know, because she ultimately, I think, is is correct in her assessment of, you know, the emotional and the anger is probably very taxing, especially for someone in her position. Um, uh, the... Uh, the cult expert that we were going to have tonight, Dr. Lalek, uh, couldn't make it. Um, not that this podcast should even go to the place of levity, but she was walking her dog and got attacked by a wild turkey. I shouldn't be laughing, but um, she she's okay. She has some scrapes and bumps and bruises, but um, that's why she couldn't be on tonight. I hope I didn't share any confidential information, but when I got that email, I was like, that is the best reason not to come on a podcast. Um, the... Um, the ramifications of this podcast are unknown. My hope is that more people will come forward. My hope is that Cheryl has found a way to inspire other survivors to leave that cult who I think I agree with Cheryl that they should have their charitable status taken away. But the reason why I think that is because I think that that church should not be considered a church at all. I, I think it's a cult. And, um, if I don't get off this podcast right now, I'm going to say things out of anger or I'm going to start tearing up because what we heard tonight was was heinous and disgusting. But what superseded that, uh, what, what, what we should put well above that heinousness and that disgust is um, the, the absolute um, bravery of, of this person. And so Cheryl Hope, this is, uh, you know, you've inspired a lot of people. Uh, tomorrow we have Richard Marsh on the show. Richard is going to fill us in on the other sexual abuse cases that the 
Plymouth Brethren Christian Church has been involved with documented uh, things that have made the media court cases and all that kind of stuff in the UK, in Australia, and New Zealand. This is not an isolated incident with this church. This church is not a church. It's a cult. Uh, I think it needs to be stopped personally. And um, so we'll see you tomorrow on Blackballed. And again, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Black, 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 black